Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens by J. M. Barry from The Little White Bird Drawings by Arthur Rackham Narrated by Aaron Robertson Chapter 3 The Thrush's Nest Shelley was a young gentleman and as grown up as he need ever expect to be. He was a poet, and they are never exactly grown up. They are people who despise money, except for what you need for today, and he had all that and five pounds over. So when he was walking in the Kensington Gardens, he made a paper boat of his banknote and sent it sailing on the serpentine. It reached the island at night, and the lookout brought it to Solomon Caw, who thought at first that it was the usual thing, a message from a lady, saying she would be obliged if he could let her have a good one. They always ask for the best one he has, and if he likes the letter, he sends one from Class A. But if it ruffles him, he sends very funny ones indeed. Sometimes he sends none at all, and at another time he sends a nestful. It all depends on the mood you catch him in. He likes you to leave it all to him, and if you mention particularly that you hope he will see his way to making it a boy this time, he is almost sure to send another girl. And whether you are a lady or only a little boy who wants a baby sister, always take pains to write your address clearly. You can't think what a lot of babies Solomon has sent to the wrong house. Shelley's boat when opened, completely puzzled Solomon, and he took counsel of his assistants, who, having walked over it twice, first with their toes pointed out, and then with their toes pointed in, decided that it came from some greedy person who wanted five. They thought this because there was a large five printed on it. Preposterous, cried Solomon in a rage, and he presented it to Peter, Anything useless which drifted upon the island was usually given to Peter as a plaything. But he did not play with his precious banknote, for he knew what it was at once, having been very observant during the week when he was an ordinary boy. With so much money, he reflected, he could surely at last contrive to reach the gardens, and he considered all the possible ways and decided, wisely, I think, to choose the best way. But first, he had to tell the birds of the value of Shelley's boat, and though they were too honest to demand it back, he saw that they were galled, and they cast such black looks at Solomon, who was rather vain of his cleverness, that he flew away to the end of the island and sat there very depressed with his head buried in his wings. Now Peter knew that unless Solomon was on your side, you never got anything done for you in the island. So he followed him and tried to hearten him. Nor was this all that Peter did to gain the powerful old fellow's goodwill. You must know that Solomon had no intention of remaining in office all his life. He looked forward to retiring by and by and devoting his green old age to a life of pleasure on a certain yew stump in the figs, which had taken his fancy, and for years he had been quietly filling his stocking. It was a stocking belonging to some bathing person which had been cast upon the island, and at the time I speak of, it contained a hundred and eighty crumbs, thirty-four nuts, sixteen crusts, a pen wiper, and a bootlace. When his stocking was full, Solomon calculated that he would be able to retire on a competency. Peter now gave him a pound. He cut it off his banknote with a sharp stick. This made Solomon his friend forever, and after the two had consulted together, they called a meeting of the thrushes. You will see presently why thrushes only were invited. The scheme to be put before them was really Peter's, but Solomon did most of the talking, 
because he soon became irritable if other people talked. He began by saying that he had been much impressed by the superior ingenuity shown by the thrushes in nest building, and this put them into good humor at once, as it was meant to do. For all the quarrels between birds are about the best way of building nests. Other birds, said Solomon, omitted to line their nests with mud, and as a result they did not hold water. Here he cocked his head, as if he had used an unanswerable argument. But unfortunately, a Mrs. Finch had come to the meeting uninvited, and she squeaked out, We don't build nests to hold water, but to hold eggs. And then the thrushes stopped cheering, and Solomon was so perplexed that he took several sips of water. Consider, he said at last, how warm the mud makes the nest. Consider! cried Mrs. Finch, that when water gets into the nest, it remains there and your little ones are drowned. The thrushes begged Solomon with a look to say something crushing in reply to this, but again he was perplexed. Try another drink, suggested Mrs. Finch pertly. Kate was her name, and all Kates are saucy. Solomon did try another drink, and it inspired him. If, said he, a finch's nest is placed on the serpentine, it fills and breaks to pieces. But a thrush's nest is still as dry as the cup of a swan's back. How the thrushes applauded! Now they knew why they lined their nests with mud, and when Mrs. Finch called out, we don't place our nests on the serpentine. They did what they should have done at first, chased her from the meeting. After this, it was most orderly. What they had been brought together to hear, said Solomon, was this. Their young friend, Peter Pan, as they well knew, wanted very much to be able to cross to the gardens, and he now proposed, with their help, to build a boat. At this, the thrushes began to fidget, which made Peter tremble for his scheme. Solomon explained hastily that what he meant was not one of the cumbrous boats that humans use. The proposed boat was to be simply a thrush's nest large enough to hold Peter. But still, to Peter's agony, the thrushes were sulky. We are very busy people they grumbled, and this would be a big job. Quite so, said Solomon, and, of course, Peter would not allow you to work for nothing. You must remember that he is now in comfortable circumstances, and he will pay you such wages as you have never been paid before. Peter Pan authorizes me to say that you shall all be paid sixpence a day. Then all the thrushes hopped for joy, and that very day was begun the celebrated building of the boat. All their ordinary business fell into arrears. It was the time of the year when they should have been pairing, but not a thrush's nest was built except this big one, and so Solomon soon ran short of thrushes with which to supply the demand from the mainland. The stout rather greedy children, who look so well in perambulators, but get puffed easily when they walk, were all young thrushes once, and ladies often ask specially for them. What do you think Solomon did? He sent over to the housetops for a lot of sparrows, and ordered them to lay their eggs in old thrushes' nests, and sent their young to the ladies, and swore they were all thrushes. It was known afterwards on the island as the Sparrow's Year, and so when you meet grown-up people in the gardens who puff and blow as if they thought themselves bigger than they are, very likely they belong to that year. You ask them. Peter was a just master and paid his workpeople every evening, 
They stood in rows on the branches, waiting politely while he cut the paper sixpences out of his banknote, and presently he called the roll, and then each bird, as the names were mentioned, flew down and got sixpence. It must have been a fine sight. And at last, after months of labor, the boat was finished. Oh, the glory of Peter as he saw it growing more and more like a great thrush's nest. From the very beginning of the building of it, he slept by its side and often woke up to say sweet things to it. And after it was lined with mud and the mud had dried, he always slept in it. He sleeps in his nest still and has a fascinating way of curling round in it, for it is just large enough to hold him comfortably when he curls round like a kitten. It is brown inside, of course, but outside it is mostly green, being woven of grass and twigs, and when these wither or snap, the walls are thatched afresh. There are also a few feathers here and there which came off the thrushes while they were building. The other birds were extremely jealous and said that the boat would not balance on the water, but it lay most beautifully steady. They said the water would come into it, but no water came into it. Next, they said that Peter had no oars, and this caused the thrushes to look at each other in dismay. But Peter replied that he had no need of oars, for he had a sail. And with such a proud, happy face, he produced a sail, which he had fashioned out of his nightgown. And though it was still rather like a nightgown, it made a lovely sail. And that night, the moon being full and all the birds asleep, he did enter his coracle, as Master Francis Pretty would have said and depart out of the island. And first, he knew not why, he looked upward with his hands clasped, and from that moment his eyes were pinned to the west. He had promised the thrushes to begin by making short voyages with them as his guides, but far away he saw the Kensington Gardens beckoning to him beneath the bridge, and he could not wait. His face was flushed, but he never looked back. There was an exultation in his little breast that drove out fear. Was Peter the least gallant of the English mariners who have sailed westward to meet the unknown? At first, his boat turned round and round, and he was driven back to the place of his starting, whereupon he shortened sail by removing one of the sleeves and was forthwith carried backwards by a contrary breeze, to his no small peril. He now let go of the sail, with the result that he was drifted towards the far shore, where are black shadows he knew not the dangers of, but suspected them, and so once more hoisted his nightgown, and went rumor of the shadows until he caught a favoring wind, which bore him westward, but at so great a speed that he was like to be broke against the bridge, which, having avoided, he passed under the bridge and came to his great rejoicing within full sight of the delectable gardens. But having tried to cast anchor, which was a stone at the end of a piece of the kite string, he found no bottom and was fain to hold off seeking for moorage. And, feeling his way, he buffeted against a sunken reef that cast him overboard by the greatness of the shock, and he was near to being drowned, but clambered back into the vessel. There now arose a mighty storm, accompanied by roaring of waters, such as he had never heard the like, and he was tossed this way and that, and his hands so numbed with the cold that he could not close them. Having escaped the danger of which, he was mercifully carried into a small bay, where his boat rode at peace. Nevertheless, he was not yet in safety, for, on pretending to disembark, he found a multitude of small people drawn up on the shore to contest his landing, and shouting shrilly to him to be off, for it was long past lockout time. 
This, with much brandishing of their holly leaves, and also a company of them carried an arrow which some boy had left in the gardens, and this they were prepared to use as a battering ram. Then Peter, who knew them for fairies, called out that he was not an ordinary human and had no desire to do them displeasure, but to be their friend. Nevertheless, having found a jolly harbor, he was in no temper to draw off therefrom, and he warned them if they sought to mischief him to stand to their harms. So saying, he boldly leapt ashore, and they gathered around him with intent to slay him, but there then arose a great cry among the women, and it was because they had now observed that his sail was a baby's nightgown. Whereupon they straightway loved him, and grieved that their laps were too small, the which I cannot explain except by saying that such is the way of women. The men fairies now sheathed their weapons on observing the behavior of their women, on whose intelligence they set great store, and they led him civilly to their queen, who conferred upon him the courtesy of the gardens after lockout time. And henceforth Peter could go whither he chose, and the fairies had orders to put him in comfort. Such was his first voyage to the gardens, and you may gather from the antiquity of the language that it took place a long time ago. But Peter never grows any older, and if we could be watching for him under the bridge tonight, but of course we can't, I dare say we should see him hoisting his nightgown and sailing or paddling towards us in the thrush's nest. When he sails, he sits down, but he stands up to paddle. I shall tell you presently how he got his paddle. Long before the time for the opening of the gates comes, he steals back to the island, for people must not see him. He is not so human as all that. But this gives him hours for play, and he plays exactly as real children play. At least, he thinks so, and it is one of the pathetic things about him that he often plays quite wrongly. You see, he had no one to tell him how children really play, for the fairies are all more or less in hiding until dusk, and so know nothing, and though the birds pretended that they could tell him a great deal, when the time for telling came, it was wonderful how little they really knew. They told him the truth about hide-and-seek, and he often plays it by himself, but even the ducks on the round pond could not explain to him what it is that makes the pond so fascinating to boys. Every night the ducks have forgotten all the events of the day, except the number of pieces of cake thrown to them. They are gloomy creatures, and say that cake is not what it was in their young days. So Peter had to find out many things for himself. He often played ships at the round pond, but his ship was only a hoop, which he had found on the grass. Of course, he had never seen a hoop, and he wondered what you play at with them, and decided that you play at pretending they are boats. This hoop always sank at once, but he waded in for it, and sometimes he dragged it gleefully round the rim of the pond, and he was quite proud to think that he had discovered what boys do with hoops. Another time, when he found a child's pail, he thought it was for sitting in, and he sat so hard in it that he could scarcely get out of it. Also, he found a balloon. It was bobbing about on the hump, quite as if it was having a game by itself, and he caught it after an exciting chase. But he thought it was a ball, and Jenny Wren had told him that boys kick balls, so he kicked it, and after that he could not find it anywhere. Perhaps the most surprising thing he found was a perambulator. It was under a lime tree near the entrance to the Fairy Queen's Winter Palace, which is within the circle of the seven Spanish chestnuts. 
and Peter approached it warily, for the birds had never mentioned such things to him. Lest it was alive, he addressed it politely, and then, as it gave no answer, he went nearer and felt it cautiously. He gave it a little push, and it ran from him, which made him think it must be alive after all. But as it had run from him, he was not afraid. So he stretched out his hand to pull it to him, but this time it ran at him, and he was so alarmed that he leapt the railing and scudded away to his boat. You must not think, however, that he was a coward, for he came back next night with a crust in one hand and a stick in the other. But the perambulator had gone, and he never saw any other one. I have promised to tell you also about his paddle. It was a child's spade, which he found near St. Gover's well, and he thought it was a paddle. Do you pity Peter Pan for making these mistakes? If so, I think it rather silly of you. What I mean is that, of course, one must pity him now and then, but to pity him all the time would be impertinence. He thought he had the most splendid time in the gardens, and to think you have it is almost as good as really to have it. He played without ceasing, while you often waste time by being Mad Dog or Mary Annish. He could be neither of these things, for he had never heard of them, but do you think he is to be pitied for that? <laughs> oh, he was merry. He was as much merrier than you, for instance, as you are merrier than your father. Sometimes he fell like a spinning top and from sheer merriment. Have you seen a greyhound leaping the fences of the gardens? That is how Peter leaps them. And think of the music of his pipe. Gentlemen who walk home at night write to the papers to say they heard a nightingale in the gardens. But it is really Peter's pipe they hear. Of course, he had no mother at least what use was she to him. You can be sorry for him for that, but don't be too sorry, for the next thing I mean to tell you is how he revisited her. It was the fairies who gave him the chance. This has been a reading of a public domain book from www.gutenberg.org. For more information about the narrator, visit www.aaron-robertson.com or find her on Facebook at Narrated by Aaron Robertson. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button.